Now it is time for our first panel of the day. I'm pleased to welcome uh, Aldo Antonelli, Professor of Philosophy, to the podium. He'll be moderating our first panel. Thank you. Thank you, Joe. Uh, I also would like to welcome everybody here to the third and last installment of the launch conference for the Institute of Social Sciences. We have two panelists today, uh, Brian Kerms from the University of California, Irvine, and Peter Bandeshar from the University of California, Merced. Uh, I'll start by introducing Brian. Uh, Brian is a distinguished professor in the Department of Logic and Philosophy of Science and in the Department of Economics at, uh, at Irvine. He's a member of the um, um, American Academy of the Arts and Sciences and one of only two philosophers who are currently members of the National Academy of Sciences. Uh, for many years now, Brian has been working on the evolution of norms and conventions using tools from evolutionary game theory to analyze classic problems in the theory of the social contract and the origin of cooperation. Um, Brian's book, the 1996 book, The Evolution of the Social Contract, won the prestigious Lakatos Award and is by now a small classic. Uh, that was followed a few years later by uh, a book entitled The Stag Hunt and the Evolution of the Social Structure, which contrary to what people might think, is not about coming up with a venison dinner, um, but rather uh, uh, on the, uh, takes up the problem of how self-interest individuals can come to cooperate on joint projects. So Brian's current work concerns the evolution of signaling systems, uh, and these are the systems and conventions that allow the transmission of information through meaningful signals. Uh, today, Brian will be speaking about the philosophical problem from David Lewis to signaling networks. Brian. Thanks, Aldo. I'm, I'm pleased to be here. Uh, I'm happy to see uh, uh, friends in the audience, and uh, uh, I'll, uh, I'll move right ahead, try to um, leave, leave some time for questions. So this is from a philosophical problem to signaling networks. What's the philosophical problem? It's a very old problem, goes back to the Greeks. Um, uh, here is Democritus, the laughing philosopher who is uh, in some ways the hero of this talk. Um, uh, the debate, the Greek debate about uh, where uh, meaning of names, or names actually mean something like common nouns, I guess, in this quote, uh, comes from, is featured in the Cratylus. Um, Democritus is on the side of those who think that names arise by some sort of chance process, okay? Democritus is called, um, the philosopher who sets the world at chance in, in, uh, in Dante, right? Well, here's, um, we, we have very little from Democritus, but we have uh, things from commentators, but here is the doctrine uh, a little later uh, in Vitruvius. Um, In the gathering of men at a time when utterance of sound is purely individual, from daily habits they fixed on articulate words, just as they happened to come, then from indicating by name things in common use, the result was that in this chance way they began to talk and thus originated conversation with one another. Okay, so that's, that's a touchstone quotation. Um, those who held this view persisted <clears throat> through later debates in the philosophy of language. Uh, for instance, Adam Smith in uh, an essay called The Considerations Concerning the First Formation of Languages um, says something like this. Um, Vitruvius talks about group interactions. Uh, Smith talks about interactions between, uh, between two people uh, who have no pre-existing language and who simply uh, try to communicate with one another because they find it in their interests, right? And he says that they will begin spontaneously to form a language, okay? Uh, so is it true, right? Or do you have to have something 
innate inside you that, uh, that uh, has the structure of the language to begin with. As some philosophers uh, have argued, uh, on the opposite side from Greek times through uh, some famous philosophers in the 20th century. Okay? That's our philosophical problem. Uh, can uh, meaningful communication arise spontaneously, and if so, how? Um, I'm going to discuss this problem uh, within the context of signaling games. Signaling games were introduced by the philosopher David Lewis um, in his PhD dissertation, um, written under uh, Quine at Harvard. Uh, Quine was a skeptic about the possibility that uh, meaning arises spontaneously and the meaning of words is conventional, right? Uh, Lewis wanted to answer this skepticism and he introduced signaling games uh, as a way of analyzing the simplest model of communication in a way that could answer Quinean skepticism. Lewis signaling games um, have this structure. Um, they're uh, is a sender who observes something about the world and a receiver who can't observe this uh, feature of the world. Um, the sender has some arbitrary signals that are simply things the receiver will notice, right? But have no pre-existing meaning. Um, the sender observes the state of the world sends one of these signals to the receiver, right? It could be waving a flag or making a noise or something, right? Uh, the receiver observes the signal and then chooses an act. Um, it is uh, a feature of Lewis's games that sender and receivers have common interest, right? So that there is an act uh, that's right for each state of the world in the simple Lewis signaling games and if the receiver does the right act for the state of the world, then both sender and receiver benefit. And if he does the wrong act, then there's no benefit. Okay? That's the structure of the games. Pure common interest. Um, clearly, sender and receiver then have an interest in getting the information across, but they have no pre-existing language to get the information across. Um, so, um, Let me um, concentrate for the beginning of this talk on the very simplest Lewis signaling game because we know a lot about it. The simplest Lewis signaling game has two states of nature. Nature flips a fair coin to decide which is the state. The sender observes the state, picks one of two signals to send to the receiver, the receiver then picks one of two acts. One is right for each state, right? So you can think of the receiver as simply guessing the state on the basis of this signal. The receiver acts, and then they get their payoffs, right? Either no payoff if it's the wrong guess, or payoff for both of them if it's the right guess. Okay, and that's the signaling game. Signaling game uh, has equilibria that solved the signaling problem. Uh, David Lewis called these signaling systems in his book. Um, they were special kinds of the equilibria that he calls conventions, okay? Um, so you see on the left hand, I'm assuming here that the, uh, the two arbitrary signals are red and black, okay? So on the left hand, uh, in state of nature one, um, the sender sends the red signal and the receiver guesses that it's one. In state of nature two, uh, uh, black signal, the receiver guesses correctly that it's the black signal, okay? So that's a signaling system. It's an equilibrium uh, in the game uh, in which uh, the information gets transmitted. Um, and on the right side, we have uh, the same setup, except the signals had been permuted. Black goes for state of nature one and red for state of nature two, okay? Uh, just as good in equilibrium. Um, 
So Lewis says, aha, we have a model in which the meaning of the signals is purely conventional. Red can mean one, red can mean two, okay. Um, the meaning of the signals um, is not something that has to do with attachment to some platonic realm, but has to do with being at an equilibrium in a social interaction that's modeled as a signaling game. Okay? So that's Lewis's uh, guiding idea that meaning is an equilibrium phenomenon in social interaction. Okay? It's a pragmatic theory of meaning. Okay? Um, and these are the only equilibria that Lewis identified in his book. Uh, but there are other equilibria in this signaling game that are called pooling equilibria. Um, and these are equilibria in which there's no information transfer at all. Um, they're characterized by the fact that the sender puts no information in the signals because the sender's probabilities are independent of the state and the receiver uh, pays no attention to the signals in that the receiver's probabilities are independent of the signal, okay? And if this is the case, nobody can do better by unilaterally changing their strategy, so it's an equilibrium in this sense in the game. Um, so there are, there are a lot of, and there are an infinite number of these, of course, so there are a lot of equilibria. Um, those are, that's the simplest signaling game, okay? And we see, Okay, there are equilibria that solve the problem, there are equilibria that don't solve the problem. We still are left with our philosophical problem. Can we have spontaneous emergence of meaningful signals? Okay. Now, I should say a little bit about what we mean by meaningful and spontaneous emergence. So what do we, meaningful, right? You ask a philosopher what things mean, right? And uh, you can spend the rest of your life listening to the debates. Right? We, don't, we don't want to do that. Um, so um, we'll move from meaning to information. A picture of young Claude Shannon, right? We'll use Shannon's information theory. Uh, and we'll not ask about meaning. Meaning, uh, you could think of with Lewis as an equilibrium phenomenon, but information is something that's well-defined uh, uh, in and out of equilibrium. Uh, and the information about the states of nature in the signals can be measured by information theory, by something called the kulbach leibler divergence, right? And it's just standard information theory, and it makes perfect sense of everything. I'm not going to rehearse this, right? Uh, uh, but that's the approach. So if we talk about the information about states in signals, then in this simplest Lewis signaling game that I uh, laid out for you, uh, in a signaling system equilibrium, uh, each signal carries one bit of information. Right? And in a pooling equilibrium, each signal carries zero bits of information about the states, and that seems to be just about right. Okay. Philosophers have written about information in signals and sort of gone off the track and, uh, 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 and, and gotten results very different from this, but classical information theory gets things right here, I think. Um, so that's what we substitute for meaning, what about emergence? Now we're talking about emergence of uh, information transfer by signaling. Okay. Uh, what kind of information transfer, uh, what kind of dynamics should we talk about when we talk about information transfer emerging spontaneously? Well, there are two paradigms that arose in our historical quote. There's the group paradigm where a lot of individuals are interacting and you have spontaneous emergence of meaningful signaling. And there's the two-person paradigm where just two people repeatedly interact. 
Okay, so we'll talk with the first one. Let's talk about a two-person paradigm uh, where two people are repeatedly interacting, uh, and we want to know if their learning dynamics uh, is going to lead to spontaneous emergence of meaningful signals. I'll use um, reinforcement learning as the focus of uh, this part of the talk. Um, so there are some pictures, oh, Al Roth is getting cut off a little bit, but uh, of uh, Roth, Al Roth and Ido Erev, uh, who focused on the kind of uh, reinforcement learning that I'm going to talk about. Um, and this learning, which they trace back more or less to the psychologist uh, Hernstein, um, uh, uh, proceeds in this way, at any time an individual has repeated choice situation, at any time uh, an individual's probability of choosing something is proportional to the accumulated rewards of choosing it in the past. Okay? So somehow people through neural connections or dopamine, whatever, um, uh, keep track of accumulated rewards in the past and then they choose probabilistically according to this rule. Okay. Um, there is some psychological evidence uh, that this is a uh, plausible form of reinforcement learning both in humans and animals. Okay. There's a, a, lot, a lot of psychological evidence, although um, uh, it can be tuned up in various ways for recency effects and various other things, but I'm not tuning it up in this talk. This is the plain vanilla version of reinforcement learning. You can think of it as modeled by an earn model. Somebody chooses something, he gets a he has an, an earn, right, with balls in it. He gets a reinforcement. He puts a ball for that reinforcement in the earn, right? Something pays off a lot. The balls for it pile up, the probability of choosing it uh, becomes bigger and bigger according to this process. Okay. That's, that's the process. Uh, we'll apply it both to the sender and the receiver, right? And what they will reinforce is what happens in a particular choice situation. So the sender you should think of as having an urn for each state of nature, because those are different uh, stimuli and the receiver should have an urn for each signal that they notice. Those are the receiver's stimuli. And then we have these four interacting urn processes, and that's the stochastic process of learning that we want to look at to see whether um, meaningful signaling will emerge spontaneously. <clears throat> Okay, well, I said that already. Save a little time. Um, here's a simulation. It's easy to write a computer program to do this. Um, run it lots of times, take the average of the times, and you get something like this. Um, the information, so information uh, in signals about states, right? Uh, we would like this to go to one bit. So that's the y-axis in bits of information. Um, and here's the iterations of the learning process. And you can see after 100 iterations, um, we're not doing so bad, right? We're about 0.8 bits per signal, right? And it looks like it's going toward asymptote at perfect signaling. But who knows, right? This is just a computer simulation. Um, so we would like uh, an analytic treatment, if we can get one. Um, and uh, there, there is one. Uh, this is a picture of Robin P. Mantle. Um, uh, and the theorem is that in this setup, you get convergent to a signaling system with probability one. Okay. Uh, we start the urns uh, uh, symmetric with one ball for each possibility. Uh, then uh, the probability of each of the alternative signaling systems is a half, right? Uh, given the perfect, uh, 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 giving us the perfect conventionality of meaning that Lewis wanted. Mm -hmm. So you get to signals, 
the meaning of signals is conventional. Okay. Um, what if it isn't uh, just two people trying to learn how to signal, uh, but a large number of individuals trying to learn how to signal? Well, now I'd like to move to a dynamics that's really on the other end of the scale, although you could try to look at things in between. So I'm going to think of a very big population, uh, and I'm going to think of the dynamics not as a dynamics of individual learning, but as a dynamics of evolution. Okay? Um, so this could be uh, biological evolution because uh, we might be interested in the spontaneous emergence of signaling systems among um, birds or bees or even bacteria. Um, uh, or it could be cultural evolution uh, where individuals uh, blunder around and look at their neighbors and see who's doing better and differentially imitate those who are being more successful. Okay? So it's either differential replication or differential imitation. Uh, lots of models of these in a large population give the same kind of dynamics, and this is a reasonable place to start in analyzing this philosophical question. This is the, the dynamics that we get is called the replicator dynamics, um, everyone will know what it is, probably. Um, oh, here's a picture, a nice picture of the young Darwin. Uh, and uh, replicator dynamics were introduced by Taylor and Yonker, right? Here's Peter Taylor. Uh, I couldn't find a picture of Yonker anywhere. Uh, I'm sorry. Uh, but uh, here is the replicator dynamics. Um, the rate of change, uh, X sub I, is the proportion of a population that plays strategy I. Okay? And the dynamic says the rate of change of X sub I with respect to time is proportional to the population proportion that plays strategy I times a figure of merit for that strategy, that is, um, the average fitness of that strategy in the population minus the average fitness of everything across all strategies in the population. Okay. So, replicator dynamics. Um, you can, if you have a one population model, you apply it to one population. If you have a two population model, you apply it to both populations uh, where average fit the fitnesses, of course, will depend on the interactions between the populations. So if we apply replicator dynamics, okay, which is rather a different kind of dynamics, um, to the simplest Lewis signaling game, what do we get? Same result. Signaling systems evolve with probability one. Okay. Uh, there is a um, demonstration of this uh, by um, my colleague Simon Hudiger and Josef Hofbauer from mathematics at the University of Vienna in the uh, Journal of Theoretical Biology in 2008. Um, there are some other things there too that I'll talk about later. So that's a pretty good result for David Lewis with both individual learning and uh, replicator dynamics and evolution uh, leading to a signaling system with probability one. Okay? Uh, but this is only a result for a rather special model right, that we put up. Uh, so uh, to be honest, we really have to raise the question of robustness of this result. Okay? If we change things a little bit, is it still going to be there? or is it going to go away? You know, I'd like to discuss robustness first with respect to the evolutionary model, uh, and then uh, a little bit with respect to the 
uh, reinforcement learning model. So with, with respect to the evolutionary model, uh, we have uh, a good sense of robustness, um, that we, a, a precise sense that we can start with. Uh, okay, here's a quiz. <laughs> Uh, these uh, gentlemen uh, introduced the notion of structural stability for differential equations in 1937, right? Andronov and his student Pontryagin. Right? Um, and the idea of structural stability is um, you have something like replicator dynamics applied to a problem, uh, that gives you a dynamics, it's actually um, uh, given to you by uh, a vector field. Uh, and uh, we ask not whether, some, um, not whether some equilibrium point is dynamically stable, but we ask whether the dynamics itself is stable. That is, if we tweak the dynamics a little bit, let's see, maybe I say this. Uh, if we tweak the dynamics a little bit, do we get qualitatively the same result? Okay, that sounds a little hand wavy, but it actually is a very precise notion, right? Because um, we can put a metric on the dynamics, so tweaking it a little bit means something precise. A and we can say what qualitatively similar means uh, be in terms of topological similarity. So how should we treat, tweak the dynamics? Um, there are three ways we could think of that come immediately to mind, right? Uh, we could add mutation because we just had a model of differential replication or differential imitation. So adding mutation uh, uh, makes sense for biological evolution. Uh, adding a few mistakes or a little exploration or something uh, makes sense for cultural evolution. So adding mutation. Um, uh, we started with states which were equally probable, right? Uh, so we can tweak the probabilities of the states, right? We don't want that everything to depend on that. Um, and we can tweak the payoffs, right? Because we assume that everybody got a payoff of one if they got it right and zero if they didn't. Right? Are the results robust? Uh, to all of these, right? Um, and um, there, there are ways of telling the story uh, that make it look very, very good, uh, but I'll, I'll t tell it the other way to give you an honest account. Right? Um, there's no problem with the signaling systems, right? You tweak everything, the signaling systems remain signaling systems, right? Or things close to them remain signaling systems, say, if you put in mutations, right? No problem with them. Um, it's, it's the pooling equilibria that cause the problems, right? So remember, the, uh, in the pooling equilibria in the simplest game, um, the sender sends the signals with probabilities independent of the state. And the probabilities could be anything, 0, 1, you know, 0 0.5, 0 0.7. So there's a line of equilibria there, right? And uh, the receiver uh, takes acts independent uh, with probability independent of the signal. So there's another line of equilibria. So there's this whole square of equilibria, right? Um, uh, this this setup is not structurally stable, right? You tweak the dynamics, um, uh, things can happen to this square. It can collapse to a point. It can collapse to a line, right? So on. <clears throat> Suppose you just tweak the probabilities of the states so that they're not equal probable, or tweak the payoffs, right, so they're not equal, right? Um, then if the receiver isn't getting any information from the sender, the receiver had better just always do uh, the act that gives him the better payoff, the better expected payoff, either because the state is more probable or because 
the states are equal probable, but the thing pays off more uh, if you're right about that act. Okay? So the line of equilibria, uh, the square of equilibria then collapses to a line of equilibria where the, where the sender uh, is ignoring the, um, the state and sending the same probability uh, signals with the same probability independent of the state, so that's the line, right? But the, send, the receiver is uh, always doing the act that's uh, uh, suggested by either tweaking the payoffs or uh, tweaking the probabilities of the states, okay? And so we could say, okay, if you do this, do you always get convergence to a signaling system with probability one? And the answer is no. Uh-oh, so this is bad news for, for a Lewis account. Um, what happens if we add mutation? If we add mutation, um, this line then collapses to a single point because there's no selection pressure on the line and mutation drives you towards the center. So it collapses to a single point. And the question is, uh, if, if the tweaks on the probabilities and the payoffs aren't too big, uh, is this point an unstable point or a stable point? Okay. Oop, oop. Let's go back. No, no, no. The other way. It's, un uh, it's unstable. So we recover convergence to a signaling system with probability one if we tweak, tweak everything a little bit. And obviously, if I wanted to make things look good to you, I could have just added the mutation first, and then I would have gotten something that was structurally stable, right? And then I could say, and we could try these other things and they don't make any difference. But you have to be careful and look at everything. Um, uh, so here is the uh, second reference to Hofbauer and Hudiger. Uh, they do this for the simplest signaling game uh, in this Journal of Theoretical Biology paper in 2008, and they extend it to um, three states, three signals, and three acts uh, in the second paper in games uh, this year. Okay, so things still look pretty good for the Lewis solution to the philosophical problem. But uh, there are other things that are rather special about our model. Uh, we have just two states, two signals, and two acts. Isn't that convenient? Right? Um, what if we have more state signals and acts? What if there are too many signals? Right? So maybe you might have synonyms or, um, or too few signals. Uh, so that you have information bottlenecks and uh, you can't get perfect signaling. Um, uh, these are things that Lewis really doesn't uh, think about. Um, the, uh, the equilibrium analysis uh, in the simple case uh, becomes much more complicated in these cases. And I won't say anything more about that. Um, And here I'll say something about a result for reinforcement learning. Um, this is uh, in a paper that's uh, not yet published. It's in archive um, with uh, uh, Yaeli Hu and Pierre Taras. Um, reinforcement learning where there are n states, n acts, so we're keeping acts just to match the states, but m signals, and m could be equal, less, or more than n, right? Uh, so there, there can be uh, too many signals, too few signals, or an, just enough signals, but, but lots of signal states and acts, okay? Um, is it true that reinforcement learning now gets to a signaling system with probability one? Uh, well, um, let's say if there are enough signals to do it, is it true? And answer is no. Isn't true anymore. Um, 
Is it true that you get to uh, perfect signaling, uh, if there are enough signals, um, uh, with positive probability? Because we actually did start out with a question, is it possible that uh, spontaneously signaling results? And the answer is yes. Okay? So not always, right? Uh, uh, but uh, sometimes, right, with positive probability, the answer is yes. Okay. Um, what if there are too few signals, then you have an information bottleneck, right, and you can't get to a perfect signaling system, uh, but you could get to something that's as good as the number of signals allow, and can you do this with positive probability, and the answer is again yes, okay, with, re with simple reinforcement learning. Now, if we have too few signals, um, you might think, if you're not uh, uh, entrapped inside the model, uh, that uh, it would be reasonable for our individuals simply to invent new signals. So here's a model of inventing new signals. Um, Remember, we were doing reinforcement learning, so we have these urns, okay? Um, and there's a model used in um, evolutionary biology called the Hoppy urn model, um, where we have urns, and evolution, these, these actually work just, just like our Lewis kinds of urns, or our roth Arev kind of urns. Um, uh, but uh, to these urns is added another ball, uh, uh, a black ball, uh, well, let's see. Yeah, so the other balls are all colored, let's see. A black ball, black ball is the mutator ball, right? If you draw a black ball um, in the hoppy urn, uh, then uh, you put it back and you put in a ball of an entirely different color that's not represented in the urn anymore. Now we could adopt this uh, model to our reinforcement learning and signaling games. That is, if the sender pulls a black ball, he sends an entirely new signal. He gets a new colored flag and waves it. And the receiver either does the right thing um, and they get paid off or not, right? And if they don't get paid off, the sender doesn't use that flag anymore, <laughs> right? Uh, but if he does get paid off, um, then he adds that color to his urns as a legitimate one ball of that color to each of the urns. That's a legitimate signal. The receiver adds an urn for that signal because it paid off, so you better keep track of reinforcements. Okay? So basically, that's a quick description of this model of inventing new signals. Um, uh, there's a paper that I have with uh, Jason Mackenzie Alexander on the left, a philosopher at uh, LSE, and Sandy Zabel on the right, who's a mathematician at Northwestern University um, in dynamic games and applications, uh, analyzing this. There are some analytical results and some simulation results there. Uh, the kind of analytical results that we got uh, before for reinforcement learning in simpler contexts uh, are not uh, available uh, at this time for uh, inventing new signals. Uh, the, the simulation results, however, show that if we start, say, with no signals, with just the black ball, and invent new signals, um, then what happens is we avoid all these suboptimal pooling equilibria or partial pooling equilibria uh, and uh, arrive at optimal solutions. Somehow invention gets us out of suboptimal equilibria. Okay, and that's not a theorem, but uh, it's, it's an interesting fact that we have from simulations. Okay, that was number of states, signals, and acts. We're now looking at robustness by looking at bigger perturbations, right? Um, well, we assumed pure common interest, right? That seems to be a strong assumption. 
Uh, what happens if you don't have pure common interest? This is a vast area, right? And I'm not gonna talk a lot about it. I only have uh, two pictures about what happens when um, interests are totally opposed, okay? So if interests are totally opposed, uh, and we do equilibrium analysis in this signaling game, we say, aha, uh -huh, no information transfer at all. Um, but equilibrium analysis doesn't always tell us the whole story. Uh, here is a picture of Alice talking to the Red Queen. Right? And you all remember what the Red Queen said to Alice. So we can have uh, a signaling system with three states, three signals, three acts, interests uh, opposed, right? So that this is a zero sum game between sender and receiver. And we can get things like this. Um, this, is, this is truly chaotic dynamics. This is just one face of the big state space in which the two, two populations oscillate, okay? But this is truly chaotic dynamics. Um, uh, this was shown by uh, Elliot Wagner uh, in uh, an article that came out in British Journal of Philosophy of Science in 2012. He's building on the first demonstration of Ham Hamiltonian chaos in two population models uh, that was published by uh, Sato, Akiyama, and Farmer in uh, PNES in 2002. Well, the title of this talk was uh, from a philosophical problem from Lewis Signaling Games to networks, so we should have networks. Um, another special thing about Lewis Signaling Games was there was one sender and one receiver, right? Uh, in Lewis, the receiver is sometimes an audience, but the audience reacts as if it were one individual. So it's really one sender, one receiver games. So <clears throat> we would like to think uh, about the case in which there are multiple senders and multiple receivers, right? Um, and they could just be interacting at random, but they also could be uh, arranged on a network, right, uh, so that they just interact with their neighbors on the network. Lots of network structures we could think of uh, in, uh, in line with uh, the philosophy of the investigation so far. Uh, we're not gonna talk about big networks. We're gonna talk about small networks. Right? Um, so we have chains. Uh, there are some analytical results actually about reinforcement learning on chains. Um, there are networks where there are many senders and one receiver, or when there are many uh, receivers that get messages from a single se uh, uh, sender, uh, or many senders and many receivers, or perhaps uh, interesting topologies where information gets passed around a network with a certain structure. There's a, a ring structure, um, which we can say something about. If you have many senders and one receiver, it could be that the senders are observing different things, right? That, that is, they're observing different partitions of the states of nature, right? Uh, and so they have different information to send to the receiver, right? Uh, and the receiver may have to put this information together in some way to choose the right act, right? Uh, this is a problem of information processing in general, right? So, uh, perhaps the receiver has to throw away some information and uh, put together other things so that uh, there's a different partition that's the relevant partition for her, his or her acts. Um, 
the receiver might have to put together um, uh, information from the senders as if they were premises um, in a deduction, right, and draw a logical inference in order to choose the right act. Uh, the uh, receiver might have to uh, compute a truth function like exclusive or uh, from uh, uh, messages from the senders, and neither of which gives the, uh, that truth function, and so on. Um, all of these and simple models are things that receivers with multiple senders can learn to do uh, with simple, stupid reinforcement learning. Uh, teamwork is a dual problem. Uh, uh, the sender may have information and the receivers may have to do acts that are somehow complementary in order to get the payoff for everybody um, so that the sender needs to coordinate the receivers, right? And we can make simple toy models just like this. Uh, and just like in the other case, uh, it's possible by simple reinforcement learning for senders and receivers to learn how to do this. These are extremely simple toy models, um, but simple models can be combined in a number of ways to make more complicated models um, so that you might have less trivial network structures in terms of information processing and coordination. Um, uh, Jeff Barrett and I have uh, a forthcoming article on self-assembling games, which tries to do a little bit of this and hopes to stimulate more discussion in, uh, on, on this problem of taking um, simple signaling modules and uh, having them self-assemble by uh, reinforcement learning into more complicated games. Okay, um, I want to say just a little more about network dynamics um, uh, to make contact with uh, uh, how the rest of this uh, conference is going. Um, Suppose we have individuals who aren't on a network. We just put them on a network previously and saw what they could do. Suppose they aren't on a network and we want the network to self-assemble. Uh, so they start just bumping into one another and having interactions and somehow the interactions drive the network formation. Okay? Um, so uh, early pioneering work, um, uh, on this was done by Matt Jackson, your keynote speaker, later uh, this afternoon. Uh, Jackson and Watts used uh, best response dynamics uh, with inertia. That means people look around and every once in a while somebody will choose a best response to uh, the network landscape and uh, either make a new tie or break a tie, right? Best response dynamics. Um, uh, Bala and Goyal, in a paper that I find quite interesting, uh, uh, also used best response dynamics, and uh, they introduced information flow games. Um, so in one of the games, um, uh, you meet everybody gets in independent information. Uh, if you meet somebody, you take them out for a drink. Right? They tell you everything they know. Um, costs a little bit to take them out for a drink, but they tell you everything that they know. Not only what they got in terms of their private information, but also what other people told them. Okay? Um, if, if information doesn't decay right, uh, in this model, uh, then the optimal network structure is uh, the ring structure right, that I showed you before. Um, they show uh, that uh, best response dynamics um, gets you the ring structure, learns the ring structure with probability one and sticks there. Best response with inertia. Um, 
I have uh, an early paper on network formation with Robin P. Mantle using uh, reinforcement learning uh, in PNAS 2000, um, uh, which does interesting things, uh, but it doesn't seem to be very good at learning the ring structure in the Bala Goyal games. Um, so uh, I was interested with some colleagues in whether there was a, a low rationality um, payoff based learning dynamics that would learn the ring structure. Uh, best response really uh, assumes a lot. It assumes that you look around and you see everything that's going on, right? And then you do your best response to it, right? Uh, so uh, suppose you're not smart enough to do that. Um, and you don't see everything that's going on. You have, all, you all, all, all you see is what happens to you, what your payoffs are. Okay? Can we have a simple payoff-based learning dynamics um, uh, that, uh, that learns the ring structure? Uh, and we analyzed um, something called probe and adjust dynamics. Uh, probe and adjust dynamics uh, works this way. People, most of the time, um, just keep on doing what they're doing, and occasionally they probe. And probe is you just try something new, okay? Uh, and if it's better, um, you switch to it. Uh, and if it's worse, you switch back to what you were doing before. And if it's the same, you switch to it with some probability, okay? And you can choose. I mean, you can be more or less adventurous in how you choose this probability. Um, Okay, probe and adjust uh, dynamics learns the ring structure with probability one. Okay, uh, so that's an interesting kind of dynamics for network formation along with other kinds of dynamics uh, to uh, look at spontaneous formation of signaling networks. And that's it. <laughs>